Hey there, once again, welcome to a very special episode of Lemon C64 Play Guides and Reviews. In this episode, we'll be checking out Batman the Movie, developed and published by Ocean Software and released to the public in 1989. The game itself opens with great music known as Ocean Loader 5, created by Jonathan Dunn, which was a remix of Ocean Loader 4. And just like every other Ocean Loader, I feel great spine tingling effects whenever I hear this music. scrolling along the bottom there the names of the coders and the programmers of this game and before we talk about this game and as we watch and wait for that great loading title picture to appear I'll just mention a little bit about the movie itself. Batman the movie started out as a comedy license and in the early 1980s it was picked up and licensed out and apparently the original movie it was supposed to star Bill Murray as Batman and perhaps Michael J. Fox, or perhaps even Eddie Murphy playing Robin, and either Tim Curry or Willem Dafoe was lined up to play the Joker, and thankfully they dumped the comedy movie idea, and they handed the license over to Tim Burton. Tim Burton's directorial debut happened with Pee Wee's Big Adventure, from there he moved on to 1988's Beetlejuice, starring Michael Keaton, and on the strength of Beetlejuice, and as the royalties from that flooded in, they actually gave the license to Tim Burton, having been sat on that for a number of years. And it may interest you that the casting for the original Batman, the straight version that is, was originally intended for Mel Gibson, who turned that down in favour of Lethal Weapon 2, and Pierce Brosnan was also given the green light, but he turned it down, complaining he could not take the character seriously. Other candidates included Harrison Ford, Kevin Costner, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Alec Baldwin was actually taking on the role of Batman for a long time, and also Bruce Willis. In the end, of course, none of those guys made it, and when Michael Keaton was voted Batman, they received 50,000 complaints from fans who definitely decided that that was a bad idea. <laughs> Batman's arch nemesis the Joker was originally supposed to be played by Brad Dourif, but apparently that was overruled and Robin Williams was signed up to play the Joker ahead of Jack Nicholson, but when Jack Nicholson was finally cajoled into the role, Robin Williams vowed never to play in any Batman movies ever again, and I don't actually blame him. So eventually the movie took 106 days to produce and Tim Burton called it torture. This official tie-in to the movie appeared also in 1989 for the Commodore 64, so let's check that game out. Batman opens with an arcade attraction sequence and some great music as well. And from here we can switch on and off the music and the sound effects. And we can also appreciate the titles there and the high scores. I really do appreciate the fact that the actual Batman logo is in the movie, uh, opportunities there. And you can see if I remove the actual logo, that's not a particularly bad job on the C64. Batman the movie, level 1, opens with the Axis chemical plant. And the Axis chemical factory is a key plot point in the movie itself. And we can see this game follows, to some extent, the movie. And what we have to do is to negotiate this level from one side to the other until we find Jack Napier and we can destroy him to turn him into the Joker. <laughs> We'll have 
have to avoid all the acid drops and all the flames and chemicals which emerge from this chemical plant, and we'll have to take down all of the Joker's gangsters as well. Luckily, we have an unlimited supply of batarangs, we can throw and destroy those guys, and just one hit will collapse their chances and we can progress through the level. We can fall through these platforms by pulling down and pressing fire, and we can also use the bat rope, as we have seen, to ascend, and as we shall see later, swing around. But for the most part, this first level is just a matter of memorizing the maze, memorizing where those guys appear, and basically avoiding them to get to the end of the level. In the very center of the screen, you can see an icon of Batman himself, that is actually our health bar, and as I take a hit there, that will start to change from the Batman logo into the Joker. If that completes its metamorphosis into the Joker, then we'll lose a life, and we have three lives, as you can see, at the start of the game. Unlike the Amiga version, we are not awarded any extra lives, so we'll just have to make those last. And of course, we also have a time limit as well, which means we have to get to the end of the level in time. Luckily, there are a number of checkpoints, and this room in particular marks one checkpoint. If I can just avoid that Smilex acid drop there. So if we die from this point, we'll simply reappear on that screen, and that is a great lifesaver indeed. So let's continue and let's try to get to another checkpoint. The map isn't so large that it cannot be memorized, and as long as we keep going in the easterly direction, we'll make it. And the enemies on this version aren't so numerous that it takes a long time to wade through those. And compared to the Amiga version, which we shall see on the Amiga channel, it's so much easier. The graphics on this first level are actually surprisingly well drawn. We can see the bricks in the background, and some platformers don't even have a background, so that is well done. And you'll also notice the colour palette, the Commodore 64 is limited colour palette. Well, it does have two shades of blue, and maybe three shades with the cyan there, and all three have been used with white and black to create this effect. At the time, I thought the graphics on this level were pretty good, and you can see those high-res explosions of those grenades there really add something to this game. And so, sometimes you can just avoid those grenades, and in this game, you can even walk into the enemies and they will die on contact. You can land on their heads and they will die, and you can do all kinds of things, including swinging into enemies and they will die. So the collision detection is great, and that helps us maintain those lives. We see we still have those three lives remaining. The action on offer is often intelligent, and action is packed in this game. If you know where to find that, again, one contact with those enemies will kill them on contact, and so there are no unfair deaths in this game. We can simply sacrifice a small portion of energy and continue. There are a small number of leaps of faith, but when the energy is so plentiful on this game, that's not so bad. And if we make a mistake, we have to fall from a very high platform to decrease our energy all the way down. So here we go, this is the final section, and I don't think we can take down guys with the bat rope, but then again, I haven't really tried that. And it's quite difficult, it's tricky timing there, we have to avoid everything, but like all aspects of this game, it is possible, and it doesn't rob lives unfairly. So let's use our Batman character now to ascend the final part of this level towards Jack Napier, and a little note about the music, it's very atmospheric on this first level, and so the controls and the music and the playability, the graphics, the mazes, the atmosphere and the character of this game is apparent even from level 1. And so let's ascend at this level, unfortunately there are no bad guys to take down as far as bosses are concerned. The final boss will take the one hit as usual, and to my mind I think that is also great. There's no point having a bullet sponge boss at the end of every level, which simply saps away our energy, which means we can take down the boss and have a great feeling.
unfortunately, because this is a tape version, every level will have to be loaded from that tape, and that takes some time, so let's skip forward. Level 2 introduces us to the Batmobile, and here we must leave the chemical plant on our way back to the Batcave to analyse some of that formula, and here we must simply pull the joystick to the right to accelerate, and every so often we will find a junction in the road, as soon as the arrow points to the up direction, we have to press fire and the up together, and then the Batmobile will swing on the lamppost just like the movie. But if you don't, and you can't press the fire and the up together as soon as you see that, if you miss, well, you'll have to go back. You can see there, I can try to go to the next junction, but it won't let me. It says I have to use this one, so we have to use this one and we'll continue to lose energy ad infinitum until we actually get there. In this case, we have lost a life. Let's try it again, and if we collide with those cars, it won't take too much energy from us. In fact, we can bump those out of the way like a pinball machine and carve our own way through the traffic. Unlike the Amiga version, we can bump cars around and that's absolutely no problem. This fake 3D version of driving isn't so bad, even though we could have had a full 3D driving experience like Outrun or Supercycle, I think the programmers did a great job. Once again, that music adds everything to the atmosphere, and once again, that time is tight so we can't afford too many mistakes. As soon as the arrow changes direction, you have to use the turning manoeuvre, Otherwise, you'll find yourself lost, and as we have seen, finding yourself lost in this level isn't really appreciated, and it usually ends up losing a life. Compared to the Amiga version, the Commodore 64 is very fun, and we don't have to concentrate endlessly on our driving skills. The Batmobile will virtually drive itself, all we have to do is to watch those arrows. And yes, it is easier said than done sometimes, because yes, one mistake can mean half energy lost, so we'll still need to concentrate and we'll still have to use our bat skills to drive this car. Once again, the controls are great, they're not absolutely immaculate, but they are certainly up to that job. And the graphics are also great, we can see different buildings in the background, even banks and things with reminders of the actual movie. And the scenery will change periodically, it is certainly not a slow game either, but unfortunately we do not get the immense speed of the Batmobile. But taking all things into consideration, this is a very fun level. And I also appreciate the fact that when we leave Gotham itself, the fields will appear and we know that we are only just around the corner from the Batcave. In the movie it appeared that the Batcave was perhaps in the middle of a park, and maybe we are in a park, but for the moment that's the Batcave, one second remaining, and oh no, we've just lost another life. Let's try it for the third and the final time to complete this level, and we only have one life remaining, we have one final life in the bank, and we'll have to make that count now to the end of the game. So I really am playing this cold after maybe 20 years away from this game, and so it's not easy sometimes to remember the pattern, but it's sometimes easy to remember the respect I always had for this game, and I of course played this for many many hours in the past. In fact, when I had a Commodore 64, my main argument against getting an Amiga was games such as this, until I saw the Amiga version of this very game, and then that switched my mind over to the Amiga. But this game was definitely high ranking and high praised at the time, and as we shall see, this was given awards in its day. I certainly say it's fluid, there is no jarring, there is no unfair deaths, and every level is playable, it's jumping, diving action, and the only complaint is obviously the time limits are very tight, and you can't afford any mistakes, otherwise one second, as we have seen, can mean a life over. point in the game with the seconds ticking down and that music heightening the tension, the 
Rain atmosphere still remains on the second level, and we certainly have to put our foot down, but on the other hand, it is very easy, and if we fail, then it is our fault and we know about it. So let's try again to use our Batman skills, let's see if we can survive this time to the end of the level, and if we make it to the outside with 30 seconds remaining there, then that means we've made it, and all we need to do is to take the second exit, and that is the Bat Cave. Avoid those joker vans and swing on in. The third of the five levels introduces us to a puzzle section. All we have to do, just like Mastermind, is to find three chemicals which have the same properties as the ones we need. And as soon as we find those, a number three will appear on the bottom. The easiest thing is to find three items which are not part of the formula, and then you will find that the correct three is easy as that. <laughs> Discovering the Joker's plot, it's time to dive into that Batwing and to take out the Joker's balloons. And the Joker's balloons are filled with the deadly Smilex formula, which is supposed to kill everybody in Gotham City. And originally that was supposed to happen in the movie, but that doesn't appear to come across, seeing as many people survive. But in the actual movie, he was supposed to kill half of Gotham, and actually coincidentally, when he says he's about to drop all those millions of dollars onto the public, those millions of dollars are actually one dollar bills, with the Joker's face upon them, so he doesn't actually give those guys money after all. But back to the Commodore 64 version, what we have to do is take down more than the 506 that we took down in the movie. We have to take down a whole field of those, and a long road stretches in front of us, and what we have to do is to take down most of those, otherwise we'll lose energy, which once again is represented at the top of the screen because we only have one life remaining and no lives given in this game. We'll have to get through this in one piece, first time. And once again, a great theme and a great sense of speed gives away the fact that this is not an easy game, although this is probably the easiest level in the entire game. All we have to do is to stay on this same plane, which is perhaps two inches from the side of the screen, and simply push forward and down on the joystick. That will take down most of these balloons. If we miss one or two, that's fine, don't be tempted to go back and collect those, because then you'll lose your place on the screen, and it's as easy as that in this game. If you miss some, or if you explode some, then the Joker will get his way, and you can see that picture is now halfway down, we have to survive. But with 50 seconds remaining on the clock, it's important to just get rid of those, and the end of the level is marked by the end of the clock, so our bat skills are really called into great purpose on this level, simply moving the joystick up and down. But if it wasn't for that fact, this level would be actually pretty difficult. And you can see even I, who have played this game many times before, am struggling there. Once again, I adore the music colorful atmosphere is recreated. Unfortunately, we do not get the Danny Elfman classic soundtrack from the movie, but we do get some great music. And at the end of this level, we will find the cathedral. Defeated the Joker's balloons, it's time to move through the cathedral, and unlike the movie, we do not get 10 minutes to rise through this level, no, we only get 6. But just like level 1, we have the same great control, and one collision with those enemies will take them down, so the game does not appear unfair. All we have to do is to make our way up this level this time, and I really do appreciate those high raised graphics, those high raised buildings, and even those windows there with a great effect on the Commodore 64. So there are at least three different ways to ascend this tall building. I'm going to take the least likely route, 
This is my preferred favourite route, and it is what I call the basement tactic. And it is certainly an easier way to get through this level. I could have risen and ascended straight away from the goal, but I find this particular route is the safest. So by pulling left and right, we can actually swing on our rope. And this is perhaps the second time that we had to swing. By timing that, we can land on that platform and then simply drop through the floor and destroy that enemy. Unlike the Amiga version, there are no rats on this section of the level, and so the Amiga version was definitely a more fleshed out version of this game. On this level, we don't have to use our bat rope quite so much because we have the luxury of ladders. And sending those, we can see the front and the rear of our Batman character very nicely drawn there. And again, those high res graphics and those backgrounds really add a lot to this experience. continue to choose our route through this level, I'll just tell you a little more about this game. Apparently, buyers of this game got a free Batman logo sticker upon buying this. I never actually got that, but that would have been a great incentive to buy it. This is Ocean Software's third Batman game, after the original licensed game created in Ice Mesut 3D by John Rittman, released in 1986. And the second Batman license was Batman the Caped Crusader, which appeared in 1988. So this being Tim Burton's third film and the third Batman movie license on the C64. It was coded by Zach Townsend, who began for Ocean in 1986 with the incompletable Cobra. He moved on to Army Moves for Imagine and Platoon appeared in 1987. The Batman Cape Crusader game, he actually coded that in 1988, and even Rambo 3 in 1988. He moved on to Stun Runner in 1990, and he went on to create the unreleased game Dream Raider in 1991. The graphics were created by Andrew Slay and he also worked on the Contra conversion, also known as Grisor, which appeared for Ocean in 1986. He also worked on Mikey in 1986 and moved on to Taipan in 1987 before working with Zach Townsend on Platoon and Rambo 3. Music was composed by Matthew Cannon, and he also created music for Nightbreed, Navy Seals, and he went on to the Untouchables for Ocean. And once again, Jonathan Dunn created the Ocean Loader 5 loading music. I find the music is very atmospheric and very well done in this game, and there are no pits of death. But you can see those spikes there, if we land on those spikes, that's an instant game over. So I think the feel, the presentation and the quality of this game really stand up. Unfortunately, it does have one major bug, and that is if you lower yourself into the scenery, you will die. And that was our last life, which means we head on over to enter our name into the high score table. try that again and let's see if we can't complete this game. Out of all the levels, perhaps level 5 is the most interesting for platform fans because we can take any route to the top of the cathedral and we can even do amazing swings and take down guys on the fly. And so things like that are amazing, unfortunately landing on spikes is not amazing, but you can certainly die just like that. And we can also die if we run out of time at the end of the level as well. And with about one second remaining, nowhere near the end of the level. So if we take our time, we'll die as well. 
but let's just fast forward back to the point where we died before, and this time let's just fall off the edge of that platform and survive. It's as easy as that. All these rope attachment points on the roof are there as a red herring, and if you use those, you might just swing into the landscape and die. So let's continue, and let's complete this review of this game. general I think this game is one of those all-time classics if not a masterpiece I really do like the fun of all five stages I like how easy they are and yet how taxing and tricky they are at the same time I like the difficulty spike and it really does move in a very smooth spike and I like the music and the playability the controls and the atmosphere and look at that we can even see the bells there in the cathedral that the Joker removed to try and block the way. So items there from the movie are present and it gives the player a sense of playing the movie, maybe much more than playing Platoon or the Predator movie that we got on the Commodore 64. Moving on to the scores. Your Commodore gave this game 56%, Commodore user gave it 86%, Commodore Format gave it 86%, Commodore Force gave it 90%, The Games Machine gave this game 95%, and Zap gave Batman the Movie 96% in November 1989. And they basically praised everything about it. And I really love everything about it. It's a great polished atmospheric game on the Commodore 64 and for its time and for its era it was voted one of the best games of the 1980s by Zap and it also received Game of the Year by Crash Magazine, obviously the ZX Spectrum version. So it was my Game of the Year, Game of 1989 and I loved it to bits, not least because of the great music. And so let's return to that title screen, enter our name once again. music created by Matthew Cannon for this game is one of the most atmospheric I've ever heard in a computer game and maybe he created this specifically for Batman and maybe he didn't but I think it fits absolutely perfectly. Let's give a listen to that music and give that a long play through. Whilst you continue to hear the music to the end, I'll just thank you very much for watching another Lemon C64 Play Guide and Review, and I hope to see you on another Play Guide and Review sometime soon. Thank you.